Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools, departments and institutes that form Cambridge Neuroscience here at the University and will reflect the pioneering work and diverse interests of our members. Cambridge Neuroscience is currently going through quite a detailed consultation process to develop six new themes to reflect the research we do here. Each of the talks in this series will come from one of these themes. For more information on the themes and the talks covered in this series, please follow the links below and follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, both my friend and colleague, Thora Caradottier today. She's a professor in veterinary medicine here at the University of Cambridge and is the director of the newly formed MS Society Cambridge Centre for Myelin Repair. So Thora did her undergraduate in Iceland, her PhD in UCL, followed by a couple of career development fellowships from the Royal Society and Wellcome Trust. And then it always amazes me such prestigious prizes that she's won in the last few years, including the Lister Institute Prize and also the Allen Institute Distinguished Investigator Award, which was only awarded to five people. And Thora was the first person outside the US to, um, to receive it. So she, as you will find out, her research is very focused on how neuronal activity uh, regulates OPCs, uh, their differentiation, and of course, all things myelin, myelin and myelin repair throughout the lifespan. So I guess, you know, if she's going to be the director of the myelin repair uh, center, that's, that works well. So that leaves me nothing but to just say, welcome, Thora. Thank you for agreeing to give this talk. And we're really looking forward to it. Thank you, Dervla. Um, I am lovely embarrassed at the moment, but you know, I am a myelin aficionado, so it's correct introduction. And I'm hopefully gonna explain to, to you all why myelin is a cool thing to be occupying your time on. So the talk I'll do today is about activity dependent myelination. And I'm wondering with a question, and I hope we maybe have some discussion afterwards, about whether that might be in fact a mechanism equally for learning as well as for regenerating the brain. Now, so um, I will first start reviewing how, uh, what is the CNS white matter and how oligodendrocyte and myelin is developed before moving into how myelination is regulated and uh, whether it's important for learning and then show some evidence for how activity may regulate myelin regeneration. Don't understand why I can't. So can you, can you press your oh, forward oh, oh. and backwards arrows maybe? Maybe that will help. Sometimes I do and it pings at me saying ding, ding, error. So you will, it, I will see how this will go. And hopefully this is just beginning technology problems. So for half of our human brain is in fact white matter. Uh, we know that in the gray matter, the other half is where, you know, the, the brain is computing. That's where the neuronal cell bodies are. And then they send their axons through to the white matter. And that is really informed in information transmission. And is using computational analysis actually revealed that segregating the brain equally in these two areas is the best architecture to maximize neuronal connectivity with the minimum conduction delays and therefore provide the maximum computational power. Yet we in neuroscience have mostly focused on this gray matter and less on the white matter. The white matter mainly consists of <laughs> uh, oligodendrocytes that wrap the membrane around the axon and central nervous system. And that uh, produces a thick compact myelin sheath that in fact lowers the capacitance of the axons and uh, increases the resistance, allows the propagation of the axon potential to go much faster. But what we conventionally think of when we think about myelinated axons are these uh, myelinated axons are completely along the line of uh, the axon, myelin along the axon. However, 
Uh, recent evidence from the Arlotta's lab have shown that if they look in the cortical neurons, layer five somewhat century cortex, here is a serial sectioning of EM and they follow the axon of these neuro few neurons. And they identified, seen here in white, just the myelin, that you have, say, for example, these three neurons, they're in the same area, same cell body size, similar axonal diameter, but you have areas uh, of the axon unmyelinated, followed by myelinated segment, followed by unmyelinated long segment, and then myelinated segments. Then you can have unmyelinated axons, and then another one long unmyelinated segment, followed by another myelinated segment. So really this, along with many other data, we may be thinking about myelination of long axons is not necessarily uniform. So you may have different myelin patterns along individual axons. So you will have unmyelinated, partially myelinated, fully equally myelinated axons along the length. And in somewhere such as in the, in the uh, auditory system, you may have axons that have increasingly shorter internodes along the length, the axons. In addition to this, this multiplies onto in the white matter tracks, you may have different myelin patterns than in between axons in the same track. So myelin patterns may therefore have some other inquences than just increasing the axonal speed or the speed of the X potential. And what we are thinking is, for example, as we know in neuroscience that if two neurons fire at the same time, that in order to excite the yellow neuron, for example, the inputs have to arrive at the same time. But due to distance of uh, difference between the, yellow, uh, the blue and the red neuron, these inputs do not arrive at the same time. One way to overcome this would be, for example, to myelinate those axons differentially. And that by differential myelination, you can adjust the speed of the action potential in order for it to arrive simultaneously and therefore evoke action potential on the yellow neuron. The importance for myelin becomes very clear in disease when oligodendrocytes or the myelin is damaged. As that slows down, so stops the action potential altogether. And that causes both mental and physical disability. However, interestingly, and this is quite unique through to, for the brain, is that the myelin in the can, in fact, be regenerated to restore function. And, uh, and this is very important in order to um, promote for overcoming cognitive and uh, physical disabilities caused by disease. But myelin appears quite late in the development of the human brain. Here are, are pictures uh, stained myelin is taken up in this dark blue stain. This is published in 1924. This is a brain just about birth, and you see the kind of anterior birth, uh, part of the brain just in the some centric kind of areas, motor areas is starting to myelinate. And a few months later, it, there are quite lots of myelination, but not yet as much as you see in the adult. And yet in the adult, you still have not full myelinations, particularly here in the frontal areas. So this ongoing myelination in the adult is driven by uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cells that in a multi-step process differentiate into the myelinating oligodendrocytes. Now, I would like, my interest is mainly for this talk is how activity may drive this process and whether, you know, also whether it does. We know as myelin comes out quite late in development, there's a time when neurons, neural axons have already passed to their, between different areas and they are active. These neurons are active, projector neurons are mainly glutamatergic. They are leasing glutamate. And, um, and that's time when oligodendrocytes are born and they migrate throughout the brain and they proliferate and then differentiate. Uh, and if you record from the early development, these oligodendrocytes in the gray matter, this was done by Dwight Burgos's lab, he uh, did in, uh, this is a hippocampal slice, and he puffed on glutamate on the glutamatergic neuron, pyramidal neurons in CA3 regions, and recorded from an OPC in the CA1 region. And as you can see that when you puff glutamate, you get these inputs, and when you block 
with TGX, the actual potential of these signals from this neuron, these inputs are gone. And during similar experiments in the white matter, we notice that you have OPCs, which have voltage-gated sodium channel currents shown by here. So they um, have very specific uh, membrane properties. Also receive synaptic input from unmyelinated axons in the development white matter, disappear in TGX. And they have expressed glutamate receptors, such as NMDA, AMPA, and kainate. And these inputs are also uh, glutamatergic in the white matter. As uh, so these are amplified and NMDA receptors. And what we've also seen from uh, electromicroscopy evidence that these seem to be bona fide uh, synapses. Here's a, a recorded OPC, and here's a uh, axonal boson with vesicles signaling to them in the hippocampus area. And in the corpus callosum is another OPC here is by expressing DS red under the NG2 promoter. And you can see uh, evidence of vesicles. And here's another recorded cell in a white matter of a vesicle approaching it, indicating, in fact, there are bona fide the synapse, synaptic inputs to the OPCs during development uh, in both white and gray matter. Uh, so how is myelinase regulated? What does these uh, input actually, or glutamate receptor, have any uh, effect or role on uh, on myelination and this is the first question i did in my lab and arena and Ipen are my first phd students Ipen is now running her own lab fully tenured in in sweden and arena is running um the neurobiology unit at the Roch, uh, pharmaceutical so they've done okay and what they did is that uh they used uh, dorsal leukanglian neurons cultured and applied OPCs on top, and they differentiated a myelinated seam here in green. And what they found in this study is that there may in fact be uh, two types of myelination. Because in these cultures, if you block neuronal activity or glutamate receptors, OPCs, when plated, they will uh, differentiate and myelinate the axons. And we know that if, if you give OPCs a fixed axons, they will myelinate those. We know that if we give oligodendrocytes um, nanofibers that are completely inert, they will wrap around them too. So there is definitely some element of myelination that has nothing to do with activity. However, when you apply uh, growth factors in the cultures, like neuroagulin or BDNF, there's upregulation of glutamate receptors, in particular, the NMDA receptors. And that alongside with neuronal activity, drives the OPCs to myelinate and alters the cells to myelinate only in an activity-dependent manner. Later, we have, it has been demonstrated that in vivo, in fact, if you block activity or lower the activity in cortical neurons, you get less myelination. And if you increase activity with channelodopsin or with dreads, with the um, GQ signaling, so lowering the membrane potential, so increasing the firing rate, that also causes increase in myelination. So indicating that myelination also in vivo might be bidirectionally regulated by neuronal activity. So the kind of merging picture is that during development, you have active neurons and they have presynapses that release glutamate. They communicate by synaptic communication to the OPC in the presence of growth factors, that would initiate these cells to myelinate those active neurons. Now, even after normal development, OPCs are still remaining in the adult brain. And if you look in the rodent adult brain, you have here an in-situ image from the Allen Institute, uh, uh, labeled against PTGF alpha receptor in white, so each white dot is an OPC. And you quickly can see that these cells are evenly distributed through the gray matter as well as the white matter in the adult, when normal myelination is supposed to be done and finished. And if we look at with a two photon imaging with, um, in a mouse model that labels um, DS red expressed in the NG2 or OPCs, this is in the cortex, going through the cortex, you can see how numerous these cells are and they are generating this tight network of, of cells. 
So the question is, what are these cells really doing in the adult brain and in these high numbers? And that one question we've been playing with is whether myelination is perhaps a dynamic process. We know that new oligodendrocytes are produced in adult brains, but that could just be maintenance. But old evidence indicate that in humans, that uh, when uh, CARES in 1907 looked at cross-section of different port mortem brains, indicated there is an increase in myelination with age, and especially in the cortex, you key, a 60-year-old has much more myelin than a 45-year-old. Of course, the problem with these studies is that we don't know whether the 60-year-old 100 years ago just had better life, better nutrition than the 30-year-old, and this is why you have a difference in myelination. So in order to uh, test this and uh, look whether we find similar things in mice, we're using uh, capitalizing on them as being model animals, keeping the same type of animals in the same environment with the same amount of food. We also find um, that in mice, myelination seen here in green is increasing in the somatosensory cortex with age too. So it's not something to do with just nutrition, it actually seems to be an ongoing process as we age, this accumulation of myelin. And this has also been demonstrated in other laboratories. So accumulating this data alongside with MRI imaging and single cell sequencing data from the Allen Institute, what we are proposing is something, a picture is a very schematic diagram of myelination throughout life. So one is the myelination is continuing almost throughout our lives, but there are other few interesting features that are kind of coming clear. One is that early onset myelination, as shown with a bit from Fletcher's data earlier in the talk, that there's a dramatic increase in myelination that slowly slows down, and then there's a second burst of myelination around adolescence, and then sadly, maybe, is that later in life, you start to have a decline in myelination. So there are these three pillars of clear changes that happen through our lives with myelin. And it's quite coincidental or not that these three big changes in myelin content correlate with the onset of neurodevelopmental disorders, onset of psychiatric disorders, as well as neurodegenerative disorders. So the question is whether myelin may have some underlying uh, mechanism in these disorders. I'm not saying it's the whole thing alongside with other, but something worth investigating. Now, with the different patterns of myelination throughout life and the fact that we have oligodensal precursor cells distributed throughout the brain um, in the adult brain, we wondered, first of all, whether all of these cells are the same. Are they all alike? And what we did is that we utilized a mouse model where we have the NG2 as a marker of OPCs label a driving YFP expression. And we looked at OPCs from uh, early onset when they first appear, E13, to uh, late in life when it's known that we start to see a decline in remyelination. And what we found is that if you just record single cell electrophysiology, looking at the membrane properties and glutamate receptors, how the cells may respond to neuronal activity, we find when they're born, they have no receptors or ion channels that we can detect, but they quickly appear uh, shortly before birth and then remain high throughout life. And then what they appear with is what's a sodium channel is this identifying ion channel of the oligodendron precursor cell doesn't really kind of peak until in around the first week of, after birth. And then you have the NMDA receptors, which are interestingly that they peak at the time of kind of mouse adolescent and disappear when the mouse reaches this tender age of senior 10 times of uh, their life. And if we take the uh, cells from uh, these ages when NMDA receptors are high or when they're low and we put them on DRG neurons, we see that the young uh, Persky OPCs myelinate those axons perfectly fine, whereas the adult OPCs, when coming to older in age, they myelinate less, indicating it's not just the environment, but uh, that there is something that has altered because we are in mimicking very young uh, promoting and media for, for myelination. What we also identify that these cells are not 
identical across uh, all brain regions. And that um, we identified, first of all, that they begin to look the same in sense of uh, electrophysiological properties, such as the ampacanate receptors, both in the cortex, uh, the cortex versus the corpus callosum, and the NMDA receptors. But once they get a bit uh, older, the, we can see a distinct difference between ampacanate, between cortex and corpus callosum, or uh, in the converse in, uh, with NMDA receptors being higher in the corpus callosum, probably indicative of the higher myelin um, myelination uh, ability of that area. And comparing the pro properties of OPCs with NMDA receptors across different brain regions, we see that they all start to have NMDA receptors at the same time in high proportions. But these proportions, uh, the time when the NMDA receptors turns off, varies differently, varies quite dramatically. And it varies between how myelinogenic the area is. You have molecular layer of the cerebellum, for example, that doesn't have any myelination. It turns off the ability to have, or it turns off NMDA receptors and OPCs first. Well, showing this to the uh, reviewers, they thought it was all okay. So they asked us to do an experiment that I thought I would never ever do. And uh, that was to record in the subventricular zone and we did that because that's supposed to be the youth area and see if it ever turned off. And to our surprise, that's a good expression, a good idea from the reviewer. In fact, we never saw or de detected the turnoff, even when we went up to P303 of these NMDA receptor expressing OPC. So it seemed that the subventricular zone is indeed this kind of youth area of the adult brain. Looking at the differences of these OPCs, we, we uh, to see whether um, the different ion channel expressing OPCs had different um, transcriptomic signatures. They took the idea of using bulk sequencing and taking when we had cells with no ion channels versus peak NMDA receptors. And the cells, here's the GOAT terms analysis, red is high and green is low. And we see that, that high in the, or the primed cells with, for myelination during the time of myelination whereas during birth, they are more in a migratory state. And then in the older age, we see that they downregulate response to activity similar to what we're seeing with the ion channel um, expressions, that their sensitivity to sense activity goes down with age and regulation of cell cycle, whereas the immune system um, mediators start to be upregulated. This experiment and plenty other experiments, and I'm not going to go into great detail, comes to tell us we are proposing an idea of how we can look at these OPCs. And this is, of course, maybe an influence that I'm in the Stem Cell Institute. The fact is that we find these OPCs that have no ion channels, and we see that the cells acquire ion channels and voltsgated ion channels, such as the voltsgated sodium channel. We then acquire the uh, NMDA receptors. They then lose the NMDA receptors and acquire very high kinate uh, density um, of uh, high density of kinate receptors. And our sequencing data and many other uh, data that we have uh, done gives us the, the idea to propose the following ideas that this may be in fact a naive cell state rather than heterogeneity and that there's high proliferating state, and then there's a primed state for differentiation, and then there's a quiescent state. And, there, and this indicates, this tells us also that the, because one type of cell is not found in every region, it's, they are always mixed, and this, uh, even if they're in the same environment, and this is why we really start to think that they might be states. So try to show this a little bit, depict, you know, schematically is that, Early in life, we had only this non-ion channel expressing cells or the naive cells in the cortex and corpus callosum. And then around P12, we start to see both a mixture of proliferative cells, prime cells, but also naive cells, only less number. So the variation of cells changes with age. With P30, we get higher proportion of prime cells, but then as we age, we start to see appearance of quiescent cells but in different, different amounts in different regions. And I think this indicates how well the cells can, can uh, myelinate. It can also tell us a little bit more about 
why we have uh, these different modes of myelination. We have cells that may not have any ion channels and not respond to activity. And then we have the cells that have high uh, glutamate receptors and particularly NMDA receptors that might be more primed for the activity dependent myelination. And then we might think, how does that fit to our lifelong myelination graph? And perhaps early in development, we will predominantly be um, driven by activity independent myelination or myelination that does not fully depend on activity. Whereas in the adolescent, when you have this another peak of myelination coming later, that might be perhaps the one that has uh, the one depending on activity. And that is actually when we see the peak of NMDA receptors if we correlate human to mouse ages. Interestingly, it's been shown that if you do social isolation during the adolescent time period, reduces myelination in the medial prefrontal cortex. Similarly, uh, if you knock out ERB3 receptors from birth, you don't affect uh, developmental myelination, but you do affect the adolescent myelination and the phenocopies, the social isolation. So perhaps this activity dependent myelination is a turn on later uh, in order to allow the individual to respond to changes in the environment, whereas the non-activity independent myelination is to so ensure survival, such as uh, important reflexes for both movement and also for sucking, which is one of the first myelinating tracks to occur in, in, uh, in animals. And uh, this alongside with uh, the fact that now we have MRI studies, they're really starting to push forward our ideas of how myelin may be plastic. And that is uh, when uh, studies were done on people who were uh, professional pianists who were, uh, were taken how many hours, they calculate how many hours they practiced on the piano and did a DTI MRI scan. They saw that the thickness of the corpus callosum was in a linear relationship with how many hours they practice on the piano. This can be argued as a developmental because a lot of professional pianists start uh, training when they're children. In Oxford, they did a similar experiment where they took uh, adult students, uh, PhD students and medical students, and they scanned their brain, taught them to juggle with three balls and then scanned their brain again. And they found that there was a structural change between the, the visual and the, and the motor cortex indicating that white matter is changing as we are learning. Recent studies have tried to do the same in mice with motor skill learning. And they show that when the mice are taught to run on a complex wheel uh, and you knock out the ability for the cells to generate new myelinating oligodendrocytes, there is a reduction in the speed of how well the mice manage to run on this more complex pipe complex wheel. So what we were interested in, and we talked to Tim Bass and Lisa Saskita when they were still in Cambridge before they left, I don't know, because they're working with me, that was the reason they decided to immigrate to Canada. But um, we were talking with them quite a lot about uh, could myelin maybe be also involved with more challenging learning paradigms where you need to think more and move less. So would it be, uh, and would, would they have a model? And they said they did. And uh, so we set up this collaboration. Well, first we had to find a way that we could identify new oligodendrocytes. So we use this mouse model where we have APCs expressing the Cree, inducible Cree. And then we know that oligodendrocyte, myelinating one, only express the promoter tau. And we mix this mouse with the PTGF Cree with the tau promote a driving membrane bound GFP. So when we give tamoxifen, nothing really happens until the OPCs differentiate into myelinating oligodendrocytes and they will become green. So only newly formed oligodendrocytes are green. So now we have a mechanism to count just green cells and that will be the newly formed oligodendrocyte. So go with the task that Lisa and, and, and um, Tim, Tim suggested it's a trial unique to non-matching to location learning paradigm. Now, for me, the non-behavioral neuroscientist, this looks awfully similar to a task that I played when I was a kid. It's like a memory task. You show pictures and you have to remember the location of the picture and then you flip to 
and you have to you win if you're good at remembering this location. It's a little bit converse, but similar. So what we do to the mice is that we show them a light and then there's a delay and they have to remember the location and then we show them two lights. Now they have to identify the new light. And if they, I'm sure you all figure that one out, it's this one. And if that is Gerek, they get a lovely uh, strawberry milkshake, which they love. And, but if they do it wrongly, they have a light shown on them they don't really like. And the experimental setup is such that we have the mice that learn, we call them tunnel. They learn the task, they get milkshake when they do it right, they get the light when they do it wrong. The yoked one gets the same amount, it just gets the reward and light according to what the tunnel, the other mouse did, nothing to what they do. So they get all confused. And then we have a home case control that gets the milkshake, but you know, just in case the milkshake was promoting myelination. So what I'm gonna, gonna try to show you a picture we took of the screen. Here is a mouse. This is a touch screen. It's gonna be, uh, go there activating the task and it will touch it. And then it has to go back here to get the choice and it gets it right. So it gets a milkshake and almost disappears into the reward center. So when we uh, uh, do this across many mice, we see that mice that are giving the reward learn the task with time, whereas those who don't uh, get things at random just don't get it. We see that we get new myelinating oligodendrocytes. And interestingly, what we see is that the number of these oligodendrocytes is much higher in the dorsal hippocampus and the medial prefrontal cortex, the two areas that are known to be needed to help to solve this task, much higher compared to both the yoked and home case control, whereas it has no difference in the motor cortex as this is not a motor uh, needed, a uh, motor cortex dependent task. So then next we look into whether this cognitive strategy uh, are associated with different uh, structures because there isn't really any direct connection between hippocampus and medial prefrontal cortex. It normally goes either through the uh, nucleus reunions, which is this known to be needed for associative learning, which is partly what this is. And it can go through the uh, nuclear accumbens, which is the reinforcement learning, which partly is also part of this type of paradigm. Or it goes through the amygdala, which is emotional memory, which would not be dependent on this task in theory. And then the uh, entrenal cortex and the spatial memory. So we looked into these areas to see whether we see any increase in myelination. And what we found that the both nuclear compounds and nuclear reunions show an increase in myelination, whereas the amygdala and entrenal cortex are not affected. So yet again, myelination seems to be very specific to the areas that are needed in order to solve this task. Moreover, to look into um, the just not just the GFP positive cells, because um, what we found is that you can have GFP positive cells that don't really seem to be myelinating at all and probably will just go on and die, compared to then you see this really clearly myelinating GFP positive cells. And when we looked into the difference between the tunnel, the mice they're learning versus the ones they haven't learned the task, we see that there's significantly more of the GFP positive cells that are bona fide myelinating. So that gives us even further uh, kind of uh, confidence in the data. So what we kind of starting to uh, depict is that, as I said earlier, myelin, white motor tracts or tracts between areas or in the cortex, axons are differentially myelinated. So there's scope for changes in the adult brain. So one is that these new myelinating oligodendrocytes are my, recruiting unmyelinated axons into the circuit or inserting new internodes into partially myelinated axons. There is also other types of myelin plasticity of the existing myelin, but for this talk, we're not talking about that too much. So mainly what we've identified in the tunnel task is this type uh, of myelination. Now, what does it matter to have more myelin? Does it have any impact? And luckily we can address this question by making another mouse and uh, now knocking out the myelin regulatory factor, transcription factor needed for the cells to make myelinating oligodendrocytes. So now when we give tamoxifen, we plot the differentiation into newly myelinating oligodendrocytes so we don't get 
this oligodendrocyte myelination. And now we can ask, what does that have? So no myelin is formed when you knock out um, MRF in these progenitors, no myelin formed you know, after that point. And what we found previously was that this said that mice had learned the task, versus the mice that didn't learn the task. And now if you compare that to the, to the cells, the, the, the mice that uh, have you can form myelin versus mice that cannot form myelin, it's very similar between the tunnel and yolk, so indicating that the cells, the mice that cannot form myelin are not uh, really understanding the task. And as we have this task, it, can, it has different levels of, of difficulty we have here from uh, separating far away to closer it gets, it's harder for the mice. We look at how many mice can go to the, to the top level of learning. And we see that mice that don't form myelin, they, they aren't getting to the highest levels at all. So they're having really trouble to, to do this task. So that indicates that this um, myelin plasticity here is important for mice to solve these cognitive tasks, so able to understand what to do, to learn it. Now, the question is whether we have then this capacity of making new myelin when we learn things. And the question for in our lab now is wondering, is that this capacity that is the underlying reason why the brain has this capacity to make new myelin when it is uh, damaged. And we know that in MS, we have here is a brain section of a person who had MS. And this is one of the most disabling neurological diseases in the young adults. And if you uh, label this section with myelin stain, it goes in dark blue, myelin is dark blue and the neurons are light blue. It's because the myelin has more membrane and more fatty membrane that takes up the dye. Here you have a lesion that is shown that the oligodendrocyte and myelin has been damaged. And there are two options that come out of this. One is that these OPCs that are in our brain can respond to this and do remyelination. Sadly, remyelin uh, seems to be thinner, takes up less dye, so we can identify it here clearly, but because it really restores function. Alternatively, there is no myelination and the axons are left without myelin and they start to degenerate and there's a sustained disability as a result. So the question is why we have this failure of regeneration and there's been a lot of debates through the years, but what is really thinking standing out is that the fact that in these chronic lesions you still have oligodendro precursor cells. There's not like a lack of the cells that are there, so this seen here in green, but there's more probably their lack of differentiation. So we really want to find out what, how we can promote their differentiation in order to prevent this from happening and have all lesions repaired. So we questioned whether myelin regeneration as myelin plasticity might therefore be regulated by activities happening in brain at similar time in a similar age. To do that, we need a model and a model myelin regeneration. So we generate, uh, we need a track that is fully myelinated to start with, and there are very few in the brain. It's really just the optic nerve and the cerebellar peduncle. And here we do the cerebellar peduncle, fully have myelinated neuron uh, axons. And we inject lithium bromide and myelin disappears. It kills everything in that little area, but because the neuronal cell bodies are far away, they remain intact. So the axons are intact and they still pass uh, active. And this comes to full regeneration, just like in and development, uh, as in humans as well. So uh, we can record from oligodendro precursor cells in the demyelinated releases during the regenerative process. And what we found is that the OPCs and lesions also have glutamate receptors, they have ampacanate receptors, and similar to development, the NMDA receptors comes at the time when the cells are ready to differentiate. We also identified that these cells have synaptic inputs. So the demyelinated axons are pre-establishing presynaptic uh, terminals and communicating to the OPCs via synapses. This has also been uh, verified in other laboratories. We also looked into, in collaboration with Sir Reynolds in the uh, Imperial for the MS tissue bank, he stained human tissues of people who have had MS 
and find human lesions of MS, and we use the weak glute to determine whether we had presynaptic terminals on the demyelinated axons. And in the lesion, we have a high incidences of weak glute staining, and this weak glute staining is very close to the NT2, the progenitor cells in these lesions. So why do we need the synaptic input? Um, to test that, we go to the rodent and we use a mini pump experiments, knowing that we can deliver locally into a lesion. And the fact that the lesion has the scar tissue probably around, it get, gives you almost like a petri dish in vivo. And we know that in the, at the time of uh, our experiments in the lesion, we have only demyelinated axons, macrophages and OPCs, and only the OPCs express glutamate receptors. So we started first to block the post synapse on the OPCs by blocking AMPA receptors. And here we see the saline, we get remyelination here, and this is normal appearing white matter. There are fewer remyelinated axons see here, as quantified. And looking at uh, showing that AMPA receptors reduce remyelination, and looking at electron microscopy where you block neuronal activity, so all ultimate release, and just quantifying the percentage of axons, we see that a fewer axons are remyelinated. Taking together a lot of experiments now, in summary, for this, we blocked vesicular release, we block AMPA and MK, NMJ receptors, we block neuronal activity, and we've reduced neuronal firing rate with using threads where we introduce the foreign G protein GI that lowers the uh, membrane potential even more negative and reduces the firing rate. All of these experiments reduced a remyelination. Similarly, in another laboratory, they've done the converse by increasing neuronal activity in the, cort in the cortisol liquid myelination in uh, the cortis callosum, and they find that that increases remyelination. So remyelination, like myelination in the adult, is by direction regulated by activity. So this tells us the axon OPC synapse is necessary for remyelination. So in conclusion, we have that normal white matter tract, if it's damaged, um, the oligodendrocytes, if the axon remains active and can upregulate synapses, synaptic communications, OPCs will proliferate and that would restore uh, remyelination and restore function. If, however, synapses are failing to appear or the neurons are not active, it will not stop the OPCs to enter the lesion well, what, what, what our data indicates is that they will proliferate and proliferate and just remain, but not differentiate, and that the synaptic inputs are necessary for remyelination. And therefore, we can now understand why you can have OPCs in a lesion that don't differentiate. So in summary of the whole talk is that we, we want to indicate that there are at least two modes of myelination. There is a mode that is independent activity, and then a mode that depends on neural activity. Now we just have to understand when and how these things are, are happening. We know that myelin regeneration is activity dependent. And we know that OPCs uh, are different in a way that they sense activity and that OPC uh, may, this heterogeneity may reflect different states. Uh, and that the OPCs with a capacity or activity dependent myelination seems to be higher in proportion in young adults. We found that the cognitive learning can evoke new myelin formation, especially in the brain structures that are necessary for the tunnel task. And this new formation of myelin needs is, seems to be needed for the animals to develop the strategies to solve the task. And uh, that, uh, you know, well, myelin regeneration depends on this active axonal signaling and presumably, similarly, uh, the learning. So I want to thank uh, my lab, which has, and uh, hopefully you've seen the pictures of the people involved in each task, and my collaborators. Special thanks to Tim and Lisa for setting up the tunnel, and then my many other collaborators in Cambridge and outside. Thank you. Thank you, Thora, for that fascinating insight into the world of Milan. Much more to come here, I think. Join us next week when we welcome Professor Roisin Owens, a multidisciplinary scientist working at the interface of biology and electronic engineering. Here, Roisin is a university lecturer at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology, and her current research centres on the application of electronic materials 
for monitoring biological systems in vitro with a specific interest in studying the gut-brain microbiome axis. Next week, she will be speaking on in vitro bioelectronic models of the gut-brain axis. For more info on this seminar series and all things neuro-related in Cambridge, follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. See you next time.